trees that we look to. So they're very tall, and when you're up there, you know, because everything's tall up there, it's really hard to get the oh, sense that they're really creek. tall. <laughs> Seven or eight hours north. But here yeah, in the southern part of their range, the first red wood range goes from the Monterey to the Oregon border, about 12 or 15 miles, and then it kind of spreads out about 5 or 50 miles from the coast. And that's the only place in the world where these coast redwoods exist. Um, they're different from their cousins, the giant sequoias, which people, it, they tend to look alike. But the giant sequoias are near the Sierra, they're in the Sierra Nevada, in Yosemite, and in Sequoia National Park, closer to Nevada. Their two ranges never actually meet, but they're relatives of one another. And the giant sequoias are the world's tallest tree, I mean the world's largest tree species. They don't get quite as tall as these close redwoods, and these close redwoods don't get quite as big in girth except for the ones up north. They can, they're comparable in girth to the ones in Yosemite and just as beautiful. But here in the southern end of their range or the central southern end of their range, the redwood trees tend to be in these very steep valleys. This is called Redwood Canyon. And they're protected from the ocean, Pacific Ocean, with their very strong winds that come across the, these ridges, um, of which um, these valleys protect them very well. These very tall things are very susceptible to windfall. So when they fall down, they do die. But as long as they're standing, they're alive. And you'll never see a standing dead redwood tree. All the trees that are standing are alive. But in order for them to reproduce the next generation, the trees do have to fall down. And when these massive trees fall down, they send up an explosion of soil and rock. They make a lot of noise. I have yet to hear one or to see one. Um, but my coworker had seen one that split. He didn't see it, it actually fall. It fell the next day. But when they fall, they actually take out a large area of the canopy. And then that allows sunlight to come to the forest floor and the sprouts that are growing around its base will start to take off. And the sprouts, you can kind of see the sprouts behind there, the back of the trees. See the little tiny redwood trees at the base to the left? Those are sprouts. And most of the time, 95% of the time, redwood trees start their lives as sprouts. And only 5% of the time, redwood trees start their lives as cones. So I'll show you the world's tallest tree species. I'll show you a cone of theirs. This little old growth redwood box. So they have small about the size of an olive. And then these cones have the seeds. And so the seeds, let's see, are about the size of a pepper flake on your pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Bell pepper flake. Yeah. 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 So about 5% of the time, redwood trees grow from seed. And we think that this tree over here was grown from a seed about 200 years ago. And the reason why we think it's 200 years, we don't do corings, we don't core the trees to count the rings on the pencil thin cores. But if you'll notice that tree doesn't have any fire scars on it. Mm. And the other trees around it do. And so the last time we had a forest fire here in Muir Woods was about 160 years. So give or take, we think that this tree started its life from a seed about 100 years. Uh, about 160, 200 years ago, but we're not really certain. We just kind of guesstimate from wh what it looks like. And so when a tree falls down, the sprouts take off, it's a race to get up to this canopy where the sunlight is. And they are one of the fastest growing trees. They grow about 18 to 22 inches in a year. But if they have really good conditions, if they have sunlight, water, and nutrients, that, which they get from their par parents because they're all growing from the roots of the parents then they can be within about 10 years you can have a 20 foot tall tree but the roots are really wide they spread out all around the tree about 60 to 80 feet they're very shallow about 10 to 12 feet so they don't really make good ornamental trees in your backyard <laughs> unless you want them to follow the your sewer lines and your, your water lines um, but they're really pretty in the um, in here in Muir Woods. And I just wanted to tell you that Muir Woods is very unique in that it's an old growth redwood forest located so close to San Francisco. 
So people who are visiting San Francisco are able to come here in within a ju just a very short amount of time to see these wonderful trees. But there was a plan in 1903 to dam up Redwood Creek over there and build a 100-foot dam over by Fern Creek. And so if you can imagine maybe half the size of this tree building up a dam, uh, blocking all the water upstream, changing the hydrology of this forest floor, it would have killed off this valley of trees. And so in 1903, the owner of this property approached William and Elizabeth Kent and said, well, we know how you feel about this forest. You have to do something or else the, the water company will, will take away the water and, um, and destroy this forest. So it took the couple two years from 1903 to 1905 to save up enough money to gather up enough money to purchase about 611.57 acres of the canyon. It, they spent about $45,000. It was a big astronomical fun uh, amount of money. When you think about back then, the, uh, a good steak dinner cost you 60 cents. So, so they, they um, as, as soon as they purchased this property, they started developing it because they wanted to make it a free public park so that everybody from San Francisco and around the Bay Area, around the world basically, can come here and to see these beautiful old growth redwood trees. And then in 1907, that water company persisted and went to the Marin County Courts and filed an imminent domain lawsuit. And before they could take away the water, because it's for the public good, before they could take away the water, William and Elizabeth Kent donated their land to the federal government. And at that time, it was Theodore Roosevelt who loved, who loved signing into legislation national monuments. And he said, that's a fantastic idea. We'll take it. And But they couldn't give all of the park to the government because under the Antiquities Act, which is what enabled Theodore Roosevelt to take the land, you had to have a very small footprint. And so they, the government only took 295 acres and William Kent spent the next 20 years of his life donating the land in small ways until now the monument is about 560 acres. And then he continued to work with the local community. His plan, his dream, was to make the entire mountain that we're on, Mount Tamalpais, a national park. And so he gave a critical piece of, of his property to uh, create the Mount Tamalpais State Park. And what he did back in 19, beginning in 1907, had a ripple effect all up and down the Redwood Range. It, uh, it bolstered the the um, conservation efforts of Big Basin State Park south of here and also bolstered the efforts of, of uh, Redwood National and State Park north of here. So, um, and whenever people were needed justification of sa for saving these old growth forests, they said, well, William Kent <laughs> gave the land to the government. And that's what we want to do to save this, uh, the, these wonderful old growth forests from harvest. So I'd like to thank, welcome all of you to Muir Woods National Monument, Muir National Park. I hope you have a wonderful day. You picked a fantastic day to be here when it's nice and raining and you can see the rich colors of these redwood trees and also feel that they are vibrant and they are living and that they are standing over us. So have a great day. Thanks for, very much for coming. Thank you.